Good morning. If you'll stand and take your hymnals and turn to number two, Holy God, we praise thy name. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, and most precious Holy Spirit, we've gathered here in your house today to sing your praises, to fellowship with other believers, to read and hear your word <laughs> proclaimed, but to be touched by your spirit and changed into the very image and likeness of Jesus, your Son. And Father, that is our heart's cry this morning, to help us to be more and more and more like Jesus. In your holy name I do pray. Amen. Now if you'll turn over to number 11. Come thou fount of every blessing.
remain standing if you'll take your bulletin and flip to the inside cover. We will affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed in unison. And this creed says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended, he descended into hell. hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As you do so, join me in this time of prayer. God, once again we come before your majestic throne of grace. We kneel and worship and we, we're in utter awe of your mercy, of your forgiveness, of your love, of your ability to restore <coughs> broken people to wholeness in life. We come and we simply want to praise you. But part of our praise, Father, includes the confession of our sins. And, and it includes this confession because we know that you are the only one, the only one who can cleanse us and purify us and make us anew into the creation you have intended us to be from the beginning. So Lord, we come this morning and we confess our sins. Each of our sins varies from person to person, but together, Father, most sins that we know of are covered this day. So we confess those that we've done, those things that we've done that are contrary to your word and your will. We confess those things that we've failed to do that you've asked us to do. We confess that we are often less loving than we should be, that we're often less forgiven than we sh forgiving than we should be, that we're often less faithful than we should be. So we confess all of these sins, whatever they be, and we lay them at your feet. And we understand from your word that if we confess these sins, you are faithful and just and will cleanse us from these sins. In fact, will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's our desire this morning, Father, to be cleansed, to be pure, to be holy before you so that we can worship you in truth and spirit. But Lord, we desire for that cleansing to stay with us. So we ask that you give us victory over sin, that you help us to overcome temptation and sin itself, that we can walk closer and closer and closer to the life of Jesus every single day. And Father, we know through the power of your Spirit this is possible. So help us surrender our lives to you so that we can be all that you have called us to be. And now if you would, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
reference to the gift generously this morning is found in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus says, From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And for the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. Let us now honor God through our giving. Father, we come before you yet again this day, ever thankful to, for your house, for your, the people who abode here. Father, we, we just praise you for our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ that make up this particular house. We love them and we thank you for them. And Lord, as we have the opportunity week after week, we, we come before you at this time and we present a, an offering, a sacrifice. A small gift reflective of what you have so given us. And we give this, Father, for multiple reasons. To say thank you. To say we love you. And to say that we trust you to continue to provide us with our very needs. So we ask, Lord, that you take these gifts that have been given today. And that you bless the givers as you always do. But that you use these gifts, that you multiply them as bread and fish. So that there's enough and even some leftovers at the end to do far more than we ever imagined. We thank you for your generosity and the generosity of these, your people. In your holy and glorious name I do pray. Amen. You may be seated and as you do so... I'm going to ask the uh, children that aren't on vacation this week to come up and join Miss Chrissy for our children.
Good morning. How are you? I'm doing just fine, Max. Thanks. We're going to be playing a game today. So, sorry that not more children are here, but you get to be the star of the show. So, we're going to play a game that's kind of like The Price is Right. But you're not going to be Bob Barker or Drew Carey. You're going to be Max. And we're going to pretend. Do you know what it's like to pretend? What does it mean to pretend? It's like maybe to like dress up in a costume. Oh, it's kind of right. Yeah, dress up in a costume. We're going to use our imagination today. So I'm going to set three things up here, and we're going to imagine that it's something different, okay? So we have a bottle of water, and we're going to also pretend I can get up and down easily. <laughs> so we have a bottle of water. We're going to pretend that this bottle of drinking water represents all the drinking water in the world. All of it is in that bottle. This is my doll, Sally is her name. <laughs> I apparently really like that name because all my dolls were named Sally. But we're going to pretend that Sally is real and that she's your friend. Your friend Sally, that's right. And we also have in here a car, but not just any car. I hear your dad saying, ooh, do you know what this is? It's a Bugatti Veyron, which is one of the most expensive cars in the world. So we're going to pretend it's not just a toy, but it's real. We're going to set it right there. Now, Max, the challenge for you is to take these three prices I have right here and to place them in front of these, okay? So I have nothing, it's worth nothing. It's worth something, and it's worth everything. Okay, all right, here you go. Let's see what you can do. Cue the theme music. <laughs> tough, isn't it? But there's no right or wrong answer, Max. You did very good, Max. You said the bottle of water, our vast unlimited supply of drinking water is worth something and your friend Sally is worth everything and the car is worth nothing. Okay, let's change it up a little bit. Let's see if your answers change. Let's pretend we're in the desert and there's no roads and you're all alone. What would you think would be worth the most? It's up to you. There's no right or wrong. <laughs> okay, so the water is worth everything. And you know why that is? Because you're in the desert. You're thirsty. Sally, your friend, is worth nothing. And then the car is worth something. Why did you say the car was worth something? Because you can use it to drive. Well, that's partially true. All right, let's try one more. This is our last one. So take those cards and let's pretend you're God. Oh, it's okay. Hey. Look here. Look here, play with this. Here you go. Yeah. Okay. So now you're God, what, what's the value of each of those things?
<laughs> All right, so what did you put for everything is worth everything? Um, Sally from Sally. Okay, and why did you say that? Because it's God cares about um, everybody on earth. That's exactly right. And if I can find my glasses. Oh, thank you. We'll read a Bible verse just about that. I'm going to move to the steps because it's easier on my knees. All right, in Genesis 127, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So he created our friend Sally. He created you. He created everyone in here. And did you know that in Romans chapter 8, verse 38, he says, or the Bible says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. What do you think that means? Mm, that God cares about us a lot. He does. He loves us above everything and all things. Let's bow our head and pray. Most heavenly and precious Father, we come before you today as your humble servants. We ask that you lead us down the path and to continue to have your perspective on life, to place the things that mean the most to you be the most to us. We ask that you help us throughout the week and make the right decisions. For these things we ask in your most holy and precious name. Amen. stand and take your hymnals and you may not even need your hymnal for this song number 193 God is so good Typically, when a pastor preaches a sermon on unity, it is because there is division within the congregation. 
And I can assure you that is not the case this morning with the exception of the choir not being real happy that I want them to be in robes. But other than that, there does not appear to be any division amongst us. My intent this morning is not to encourage you to get along with one another. You are doing that wonderfully well. But rather my intent is to talk about the power of being united in purpose. The power of being united in purpose. Dr. Wynn Aaron is the founder of the Institute for American Church Growth. And in his role as a, a church consultant and researcher, he surveyed members of a thousand congregations asking this simple question. Why does the church exist? Why does the church exist? Of the church members surveyed, 89% of those responded, those church members responded in one way or another that would fit into this one category. And that category was that the, church, the church's purpose is to take care of my needs and those of, the, of my family. For many, the role of the pastor was simply to keep the sheep that are already in the pen happy and not lose too many of them. Only 11% of the church members surveyed said that the purpose of the church is to win the world for Christ. Now interestingly enough, he surveyed the pastors of those same thousand congregations. And amazingly, the results were almost exactly the opposite. Of the pastors surveyed, 90% said that the purpose of the church was to win the world for Christ and 10% said it was to care for the needs of the church members. Is it any wonder that there is such conflict, confusion, and stagnation in so many congregations and even denominations today? We're unsure of our purpose. We're in disagreement with our purpose. Now I'm hesitant to call the church an organization but on a certain level it is. And there is a foundational principle that applies to all organizations, which includes the church at large, as well as every congregation, including here at First Cumberland. And that, princi that principle is this. Nothing precedes purpose. Nothing precedes purpose. That is why very early in my ministry here, nearly eight years ago, and by very early I mean during the first month of my pastorate, I introduced you to the following purpose statement. For the glory of God, Knoxville First Cumberland Presbyterian Church exists to worship Christ, evangelize the lost, love one another and our neighbor, and learn more about our God. Again, this is a purpose statement, not a mission statement. Any mission statement we adopt should flow from the purpose in which we are united. The starting point for every organization should be the question, why do we exist? What are we here for? Why do we exist? McDonald's knows it exists to sell hamburgers and french fries, not life insurance. General Motors knows it exists to manufacture automobiles, not hammers. Until a congregation knows what it exists for, it will have no foundation, no motivation, no direction, and no unity as it continually attempts to accomplish things outside its purpose. The early church knew why it existed, and the members were unified around that purpose. With all that said, I'm going to ask you to please rise and body your spirit in honor of God's word. Recorded in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. Here Luke writes, Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possession, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was among them all. 
the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you speak to us this day. Speak to us clearly and plainly. Use my words if possible, but if not, drown me out so that we will fully understand the power of our unity in Christ. In your holy and glorious name, I do pray. Amen. You may be seated. I attempted to make this point a few weeks ago by comparing a cruise ship to a battleship with the point being that Jesus calls his followers not to a life of leisure, but to a life of service. This fact is clearly revealed in the book of Acts and its recorded history of the early church. While each follower of the risen Jesus had a different task, they all had the same calling, and that was to fulfill the great commission of making disciples from all nations in their lifetime. Jesus didn't say it take a thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years, whatever it takes to do this. The great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that he has taught them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit was intended to take place in their ministry, in their lifetime. They had one purpose. One purpose. And that was to communicate the gospel to all people. Those early disciples did more for the spread of Christianity than any generation of followers since. What was their secret? Our text for today, I think, gives the answer. And that is, they were of one heart and one soul. That is, they were united in purpose. All the believers shared in this unity, not just the apostles, not just the leaders. All the believers were united. There was a fundamental solidarity of purpose. Now, the unity of purpose was possible because they were family. They were family. Not necessarily biological family, but family nonetheless because they shared the same spiritual father, God Almighty. This was because they shared a spiritual birth. That is, they were all born again into the family of God. As family, they shared their lives and their possessions with one another. Their lives with one another. It went beyond a kind word or a pat on the back. They gave priority to meeting the physical and practical needs that were evident in the church. One of my favorite preachers, Chuck Swindoll, he wrote one time in one of his many, many books, he wrote, churches need to be less like untouchable cathedrals and more like well-used hospitals. Places to bleed in rather than monuments to look at. Places where you can take your mask off and let your hair down. Places where you can have your wounds dressed. The early disciples found genuine sense of belonging in their community of faith. It wasn't just a membership. They were family. And they knew it. As important as the sense of community was to these early followers of Jesus, these men and women did not assemble merely for family gatherings and dinners or for making sure that their physical needs were met. They came together in order to accomplish an objective. They were partners in reaching the world for Christ. Their linked hearts and souls, or they linked their hearts and souls not just for convenience or comfort or support, but to reach out to those who were not yet linked up with them. The members of any congregation are a group of followers of Jesus with various backgrounds, with different interests, different gifts, and different perspectives. But they have been called together for a singular purpose. And that purpose is to cooperate together and reaching out beyond our four walls so others can know the saving grace of Jesus. 
My favorite definition of evangelism, and I've shared this with you before, is beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. Can you imagine being starved beyond hope and finding a batch of bread big enough to feed everyone you know and then decided I'll just keep this as a secret to myself? They don't need to know this. I mean, that's more than I could ever eat, but that, that's for me. Can you imagine that? This means no. This means yes. This means I done went to sleep. Okay? Beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. Simply put, we, we, you and I, Knoxville First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We are in the soul saving business. And that endeavor is accomplished best when we understand that we are a family of friends in partnership with each other. The title of this message is The Power of Unity. But the reality is that unity, like that proverbial chain, is only as strong as its weakest link. So we must ever be on guard to protect our unity. Now purpose is the power in the engine of life. Purpose is the power in the engine of life. Purpose assures us that the steering wheel is connected to the engine. Without purpose, there is motion without emotion. Anybody here ever just come to church because you were going through the motions? Oh, nobody raising your hand? I'm the only one. All right, I got two more honest people in the congregation. Without purpose, there is motion without emotion. Without purpose, there is activity without accomplishment. Without purpose, there is efficiency without effectiveness. Think of light for a moment. Other than illumination, diffused light has no power at all. But by focusing the light of the sun through a magnifying glass, I remember doing this as a child, focusing the light of the sun through a magnifying glass, we can set a leaf on fire. And if we're not real careful, we can catch the hay in the barn on fire and get in all sorts of trouble. But that's another story. We won't talk about that. But through the, that light, through that magnifying glass, can catch a leaf on fire. And then when that light is concentrated at a much higher level, like a laser beam, it can even cut through steel. The early disciples had a laser-like focus on their purpose. And the corresponding result was divine power. This power was evidence in the incredible growth of the early church. We know that on that first post-resurrection Pentecost, some 3,000 people repented of their sins and were saved. It is estimated by some biblical scholars that at least 100,000 people came to Christ there in Jerusalem in that first 25 years. 100,000 people. That is power manifested. Phenomenal growth was one evidence of being united in purpose. The ability to withstand satanic attack was another. As soon as the Holy Spirit came upon the church, Satan lost a ferocious counterattack. You see, Pentecost was followed by persecution. Pentecost was followed by persecution. Have you ever noticed in your own spiritual life that the mountaintop experience is immediately followed by the valley? This means yes. You know why? Because persecution always follows Pentecost. First, there was physical violence and many followers of Jesus were thrown into prison and some of the early church leaders, such as Stephen, were executed. Second, there was moral corruption and Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira introduced greed into the interior life of the church. And then third, there was the subtle ploy of professional distraction intended to deflect the apostles 
from their priority of prayer and preaching by preoccupying them with social administration that is feeding the widows. A wonderful thing to do, a needed thing to do, a necessary thing to do, but not their calling. Oh, how often we get distracted doing what is needed, what is necessary, what is good, but not our calling. That's not true only of ministers, by the way. That's true of all of us from time to time. In each case, the early church withstood the attack and stayed true to its purpose of reaching people for Christ. In addition, the power of unity was evidence in the early church finding strength in diversity. Strength in diversity. These early believers quickly realized that their diversity could either be a source of division or a source of power. They chose, intentionally chose the latter. They were not all alike. There was a plethora of opinion and a wide assortment of gifts, but they found ways to integrate their differences to, into a symphonic whole to create a singleness of spirit and a purpose. In short, they resembled a symphony. They played different instruments and they played different notes for the person sitting next to them. But their variety and diversity created a more magnificent sound than if they were all playing the same instrument, playing the same note. Unity exists among diversity because we all follow the same musical score written by the same composer. It's not our song we sing. It's God's. Unity exists among diversity. We're diverse here this day. Not as diverse as some crowds, but we are diverse. Some been in church all your life, some are new to it, some come from various backgrounds, other than come from Presbyterians. In fact, most probably do here. Men and women, old and young, good looking and ugly. Diversity. Some play golf, some can't even play putt putt. Diversity. Unity exists amid diversity because we all follow the same musical score written by the same composer. Because the early followers of Jesus were unified in purpose and because they were committed to the task of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus, God smiled down on them with favor. Or as our text for today says, great grace was among them all. Do you know that when we get together working on God's purpose, His grace flows over us like a waterfall? Yet when we're divided, we often feel barren and parched, do we not? Now again, there's no division here. I'm not preaching against that. I just want us to see the power of unity. When we are united in purpose, and that purpose is Christ's purpose, then grace flows over us like a waterfall. It's an awesome thing to be in the waterfall of God's grace. Because these early believers were generous to others, God was generous to them. Because their heart's passion was, was God's heart's passion, God smiled upon them. Because they held in high esteem the purpose of Jesus, God held them in high esteem. It seems to me that there exists, both as individuals and as congregations, a direct correlation between our faithfulness to God's plan and God's favor in our lives. Stated very simply, if we want to experience God's blessings, and I've never met anybody that told me they didn't, if we want to experience God's blessings, 
We need to first be obedient to his purpose. And guess what? And I find this very comforting. We do not have to be perfect in our efforts. Just focus on his purpose. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, on the last night of his life, Jesus prayed for the unity of his disciples, both present and future, which, by the way, includes you and I, with death breathing down his neck. Jesus prayed not for his followers' success, not for our safety, not for our happiness. Instead, Jesus prayed for our unity so that we could fulfill his purpose. Of all the lessons we can draw from Jesus' prayer there in the 17th chapter of John, do not miss the most important lesson. And that is that unity matters to God. Unity matters to God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in perfect unity. And He wants us to be in unity as well. Why does unity among believers matter? It matters because unity helps create belief. How will the world believe that God sent Jesus. Not if we agree with each other. Not if we solve every controversy. Not if we never make a doctrinal error. But if we love each other. If unity creates belief, then this unity fosters unbelief. How can the world come to believe the gospel if those who already claim to believe it are constantly battling among themselves. When the world sees members of the same congregation, when they see us dueling over worship styles or splitting the church over the color of the new carpet, the world says thanks, but no thanks. If unity is the key to fulfilling the God-ordained purpose of spreading the message of Jesus Christ, it should have precedence in our prayers. Now think about that. How often do you pray for unity with other believers? I would like to issue this challenge. That at least one of your prayers, daily prayers. Now notice I'm assuming, first of all, you're praying and you're praying more than once. But... This challenge, that at least one of your daily prayers includes the unity of this congregation so that we can march forward into a world that needs to see Christ. Since unity matters to God, it should matter to us. But interestingly, nowhere in Scripture are we told to build unity. Instead, we are instructed to simply keep or protect unity. So the question becomes, how do we do that? Does keeping unity mean that we compromise our convictions? Listen to me very closely. No. 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 Unity does not mean that we compromise our biblical convictions. But it does mean that we look long and hard at the attitudes we carry. You see, unity does not begin in examining others, but in examining self. Unity begins not in demanding that others change, but in admitting that we are not perfect ourselves. Unity continues as we humbly serve those who are different from ourselves. God favors those who take the message of Jesus Christ to a divided world. That is our purpose. Let us continue, continue to be unified in it and thus fully know the power of unity. That's my supposition this morning. 
again, that we are unified. And I think over the last few months and into the future, we're beginning to see the results of unity. So my request again is to make it a daily prayer. Protect our unity. Protect it. Pray for it. And move forward boldly with the gospel of Christ. Let us pray together. Father, we come before you yet again. And Lord, I probably made a mess of this, but you're quite capable of speaking without me. But help us, Lord, to understand the power of being united to fulfill Christ's purpose for his church so that we can see the things that the early church saw, that we can see people being converted, people being saved, people growing in grace and mercy, people sharing the gospel and sharing their lives with each other. Help us, Father, to be more and more and more like Jesus. In your holy name, amen. If you'll stand and take your hymnals and turn to 415, we are called to be God's people. privilege of meeting this couple to, I say Doug, and this would be Mary, yes, <laughs> Doug, Doug and Mary Wagner. I had the privilege of meeting Mary and mutual friends nearly eight years ago, very shortly after I arrived here. I met Doug not too awful long after that, continued to see Mary from time to time, and, and then a year and a half ago, maybe just right before the COVID mess hit, they started showing up on Sunday mornings and have been back ever since we uh, resumed our worship. And Doug's been in the choir for the last several months and uh, they come this morning and want to officially unite with this body. And so they come by statement of faith, both professing to me that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, 
They had both received the sacrament of baptism. Their last church membership was at Fellowship Church uh, over on Middlebrook Pike. So uh, they come this morning by transfer of letter. I would entertain a motion from one of our elders that they be received into the full fellowship of the church. And I heard two or three so moves and our inner second eventually came in too. So we'll, we'll consider that done. Uh, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed, oh, say nay. <laughs> Knowing there would be none. We are thrilled that you are here. Again, COVID has robbed us of a lot of things and the ability to extend the right hand of Christian fellowship is one of those things. But uh, wave at them from a distance. Talk to them when you can. Uh, be in Sunday school, you can meet them and, and, and greet them there. And uh, maybe their contact information will probably be in the newsletter this week if you want to call and say welcome. But we are thrilled that they are officially a part of us. They've been part of us for a while, but now officially. And then I have one more thing. I mentioned earlier in the announcements that this was Ann's last Sunday. So I need her to come forward just for a moment. And uh, like to but um, give her the virtual hug via phone or email or something this week. If you would please stand with me now for our benediction. Believe in the risen Jesus and live accordingly by uniting in the power of his purpose for our, your lives. In the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>